frost will strongly melt in 10 years. I'm not sure modern empire will survive so long a time. Today we're screening Pleistocene Park, a documentary that has all the tropes of a mad Russian scientist who's trying to save the world from climate change. The main character is doing fringe science on the fringes of society. He might be a lunatic, but he also might be onto something. Stick around after and we'll talk to the filmmaker. Directed by Luke Griswold Turgis. Here's Pleistocene Park. Ask me how many animals I want. I want to have maybe 200 million of horses. Also, I want to have maybe 200 million of bison. I think it's optimum for our planet. What I see in history, it looks like Humans don't want to see wild animals in our planet. Humans want to occupy all landscapes alone and kill all wild. I do propaganda. Look, please, how beautiful these animals. Let's present this territory for wild. Because life in our planet and climate will stable only if it will be wild, if wild will survive. Так, и сколько их здесь? Раз, два, три, четыре, пять, шесть, семь, восемь, девять. We are not trying to invent a bike. My father and I want to restore ecosystems which were in this place before first humans came to this land, which will not only make this a northern Serengeti, but will also allow to mitigate climate change. Dans le sous-sol gelé de la Sibérie, une bombe climatique est amorcée. Le permafrost est en train de fondre. I'd finished my first documentary and was looking for a new project. I sent Sergei Zimov an email. He wrote back right away, said I should come to Siberia. They live in the far northern corner of Yakutia, an indigenous republic in Russia. I took the short way. It still took me six days. Zimov has an impressive list of peer-reviewed publications. He discovered that frozen Arctic soil locks away twice as much carbon as the Earth's atmosphere. It's on the verge of melting. It could set off a runaway feedback loop of warming and melting that makes climate change unstoppable. Hey, hey. One scientist I talked to called Zimov, the smartest person he'd ever met, and batshit crazy. Here's the crazy part, the part that didn't get peer-reviewed. He thinks he can stop permafrost from melting by restoring the Ice Age mammoth step ecosystem. He's thinking big, like converting the northern half of Asia, plus Alaska, and most of Canada to grasslands full of roaming herds. Like a kind of woolly Noah's Ark, he started bringing animals back and releasing them in Pleistocene Park. The slide is good, and it's the most convenient place to do movement here. Well, let me stick this microphone on you, Sergei. This is typical forest, 
And it's most typical landscape in our territory. There is nothing to eat for herbivores. Now we will go 100 meters from this place and I will show how changed this type of vegetation after disturbing and grazing of animals. Now it's grassland. Before people occupied this territory, it was typical landscape for all this territory. Cutted shrubs, cutted grass, and millions of animals. We don't really care about blood purity. It can have five legs or six legs, I don't care. As long as it eat grass, reproduce, make more fertile soils, that's what's the most important. So right now in the park we have around 30 horses, around the same number of reindeer, some moose, bison, few muskox. We need more muskox, clearly. And secondly, it would be nice to have Canadian wood bison. That's clearly the species which we would really love to have. I don't know what I expected to find, but it's not exactly the great thundering herds I was visualizing. It's hard to imagine a few horses and a lonely bison in a mosquito swamp saving the world. It's no, just not a special research purpose. Не надо, ну понимаешь, все равно нужно хоть кого-то. Пока ты принципиально решишь, вся жизнь пройдет. I was just opening a beer when Nikita told me we were leaving to pick up a load of reindeer from Chukchi reindeer herders. Apparently he needed another boat driver. And journalists can't be parasitic all the time. Standing in the middle of a reindeer herd in the 2 a.m. Arctic twilight is something I'll never forget. For a moment, I could feel Zimov's lost ecosystem swirling around me. How is it going? Well, so far, so good. We've got 10. How many are you trying to get? Ten. Our transportation of rangers is never a nice thing. No one really knows how to build new ecosystems. Basically, once the only way to do it is just to test. You bring a little number of animals of this type, of this type, and say, oh, kind of this worked out, this didn't work out. I do this ecosystem not for abstraction. It's not some zoo where I stand outside and look, like an aquarium. No, I participate in this ecosystem. I do it for me. It's my planet, it's my garden, it's my animals, it's my collaborators, my friends, my food. I want to participate. Humanity seems paralyzed trying to address climate change. Now, deep in the Siberian wilderness, this madman genius is acting on his plan to keep permafrost frozen. We could all use a faint glimmer of hope about now. Could this be it? Чего 
они как раз боятся. Я Молчи, пожалуйста. Во-первых, ощущение, что ведет ее, вот ощущение, как будто с тебя колесо. Ты едешь, ты чувствуешь там прям что-то вот. Very frequently people give me advices how should I develop the park. Now I received very nice letter which it's actually the first time we ever received such a letter. Dear Nikita and Sergey, like I have checked the both English and Russian version of the website and I didn't find the link to where I can submit the money. Пожертвование, типа, типа, а где пожертвование вас? <laughs> did you answer the letter? Yes, I did. To this, I did. <laughs> I replied him that no, we don't have it, but it's very nice to have your letter because usually people come with advices and you're the first person to come offering help actually. <laughs> Катюша, близко не подходите, лучше вообще с того обрыва. Катюша! Many people like who heard about the park, they think that it's like a huge scale project. Unfortunately, that's not like that. It's rather our personal little investigation. No, any politician call me money, yes. Therefore, I do conclusion. Carbon dioxide is games for our politicians. They not so much think about his grandchildren. All north of Siberia is underground glacier. Glacier which very sensitive for any climate warming. This sediment is biggest storage of organic carbon in our planet. It's soil of mama steppe ecosystem. There's many excrement of animals, there's many living microbes. There's fresh roots of grass. When it's melt, microbes immediately wake up. These microbes did not eat 30,000 years, therefore they very angry. If climate change and permafrost melt, big part of this carbon soon will appear in our atmospheres like greenhouse gases. It will much increase global warming. It will increase melting of permafrost. Emission of greenhouse gases will grow. Finally, this sediment is very dangerous for stability of climate of our planet. Let's go. Zimov's discoveries about permafrost carbon rocked the world of climate science and raised big questions. How quickly would permafrost thaw? How much CO2 and how much methane would be released? Waves of researchers begin setting out for the Arctic every summer to untangle it all. This is sort of where it's happening in terms of climate change. This is the frontier. This is what we know the least about, and we need a lot more information about it. There's so much complexity to the system that we as scientists are working really hard to try to pull in all of the pieces of the puzzle so that we can actually make predictions about what the impact is. Twenty-one. So there's a a layer of organic soil here. We've got some moss and then roots and old vegetation. And then below that, there's a layer of gray clay-like mineral soil. What's below that is permafrost, which is ground that's frozen for two or more years consecutively. 
It looks and feels like frozen concrete. It's actually a really big problem because once you start thawing the permafrost, there are positive feedbacks built in, so you can't stop it. For stabilization of permafrost in big territory, you need to have 20 million animals. If you want to receive this volume of animals in 40 years, you must start with thousands of animals. And it's not so expensive and not so difficult bringing the far north two, three thousand of bison. In the chaos of late 90s Russia, when nothing was certain that anything was possible, Zimov saw a chance to make his vision a reality. All he needed was a couple thousand bison, some horses, reindeer. He could transform a continent, restore the balance between humanity and nature, and stave off the apocalypse. What could possibly go wrong? My father started to try to bring bison from Canada and he was arranged with Canadian and Yakutian governments. I met with Yakutian bureaucrats and discussed this idea. The government of Canada was recommended to donate a party of Elk Island National Park wood bisons. He spent almost six years trying to bring bison to Pleistocene Park, including several trips to Canada. But there was a big difference in some ideology which Yakutsk bureaucrats maintain, and my idea. All of a sudden, like, Yakutian government decided that they would rather take it not to Placent Park, they would rather keep bison somewhere close to Yakutsk. And they said to my dad, okay, no bison for you, sorry. And my dad was so, like, incredibly upset that I think he yelled at some bureaucrat there. He's, like, super undiplomatic. Enough. I don't like discuss these questions. I'm very upset about my country. It's very difficult to decide any problem with money with Russian government. Therefore, I told, I will decide scientific problem and never will ask help in the government. I'm going to in increase methane concentration in atmosphere just a little. Occasionally locals find an orphaned baby moose and bring it to Zimov like a consolation prize for the bison he never got. He do good attack. It's typical for young moose. When the Canadian wood bison plant fell apart, Sergei and Nikita decided they'd just bring animals themselves, by whatever means necessary. They did several very dangerous trips. In every trip, you need to count percent of happiness and percent of dangerous. For Muskox, we had to drive to the Rangil Island. We don't have money to rent a helicopter and fly there. So it kind of was a way to do it kind of cheap way. 
открытая, блядь, я не помню просто, я не, не вижу, куда чего тыкать, блядь. Глюк, выключи эту хуйню. So you drive from here to the Arctic Ocean. The workers of this national park already caught us some. But then when everyone were weighed, cable poor bear and broke the fence, killed one of the baby muskox and the rest escaped. So the next 10 days we had to drive through this isolated island, this fog, wind, cold. And we had to look for the brand new ones. On the way back for two days, we were in the open ocean in the bad storm and our GPS did not work. People were seasick. Also, baby muskox felt seasick. And I think total it took us about 25 days to a month. Unfortunately, all six of them turned out to be males, which was a great disaster for us. It wasn't really the trip which you want to do on any old basis, you know, like once a life is more than enough. <laughs> After that trip, you would expect Zimov to be a bit dejected. But when it comes to his own ideas, Zimov is a kind of pathological optimist. There is elk for like 500 bucks each. Once again, we decided to go, oh, that's cheap, that's easy. Why not? One more interesting and dangerous trip. <laughs> bought like six elks, put them in the back of the truck. I was like big hurry because like the spring was coming. I had to drive 17 hours every day. My wrist feel like a big pain because it's a bumpy road. And my old brakes broke, all light broke. Then engine got hole in it. Then radiator got a hole in it. There was no road at all for the last part. Nikita drove for a week on the frozen Kolyma River. My truck was the last that season who made this road and five trucks drowned it behind me. We asked all drivers who went to Yakutsk, if you meet Nikita, help him. <laughs> when I was already 40 kilometers away from home, two days without any sleep already. And since I didn't have any brakes, hit the side of the road and gently laid on the side. I knew like it wouldn't hold animals. And I was already at that time kind of insane -ish. They would escape, I would probably broke. And then my dad came with a friend of ours in a big truck and we put the car back on the wheels and I finally made it to the park and we released them all of them that same day. But there, I don't know, probably could be outside of the park. That wasn't a very successful experience with them. It appears that our fence is not, not a problem for them at all. Elk jumps through this fence much easier than moose. Try to step, but elk jump so easy, like... <laughs> Still undeterred, Zimov came up with another plan, fly in Wizen, European bison. My dad got five pheasants from the national park next to Moscow, and they flew them in the cargo section of the regular airplane. Then my dad was very optimistic that they would be all right on their own. Some of them got sick, and only the oldest one survived. We have some sort of a bison curse. We do provide him food, but I think we provide it just to keep him near, so we would actually prove that we do have a bison, to buy his loyalty, let's say. It's actually grew up a bit. This bison is very grumpy, Sergey. Grumpy, what does it mean? Yes. I think originally my dad was very optimistic how the place in park will be developing and he thought that you just need to bring few animals and the ecosystem will be just jumping from one sustainable state to another sustainable state. And reality showed that it's way more complicated.
My father grew up not far from Vladivostok. He always wanted to be a scientist, he always liked the nature, he liked to go hunting, he liked to be away from all the Soviet communistic bureaucrats. He wanted that, he got it. It's very difficult to, to do science research in Moscow, where it's boring life. My life was in Tundra. It was most tension. There was no electricity. We didn't have TV. We built a small world around us, and we lived in this world. We was happy in our place. The main reason my dad went to the Arctic was because he wanted to study wilderness. And after some discoveries, he figured out that it's not a wilderness at all. It's a huge landscape free from wild animals. Just in 100 years, hundreds of thousands of reindeer cross Kalama River just here each autumn. Now there's no any wild reindeer. Modern people, sure, if this is wild, it's typical. It must be like this. If they see five moose in one place, oh, it's so unusual, huge density of mooses. But it must be five mooses per each square kilometer. So he came to this place, lots of mosquitoes, all tussocks, and like nothing to hunt. He's like, oh, how do I change this thing? Brick by brick, place and park theory was developing. If I was sit in this cliff in Pleistocene, it was possible to see 3,000 big herbivores just from one place. I think there is like a skeleton of mammoth out here. We already found like 20 bones. Those are all like finger bones there, right? Yeah, yeah. Each year, bones appear on the beach. We drive, we collect all bones. Many years we did this collection. Now I wanted to be a dentist. It's a full collection. It means it's good statistic example. And if you would go for a kilometer, you will be able to find about a thousand different animal bones. Most people was sure mama step it was like polar desert. But bones is very good data, it's good fact. In each square kilometer of this pastures in Pleistocene, there was one mammoth, five bison, seven horses, 15 reindeer, and other animals which was not so much. So horses and bison were more abundant animals. And these are animals which we can actually get access to. What scientists do when they do experiment with some biological processes, they used white mouse. I used white horse. The first experiments we start in the Soviet time. We quickly build the fence, bring horses, and the next years, beautiful high productive meadow appear in this place. And we see if it's happened in small territory, it will happen in the any territory. My job was done excellent. Will politician use my discovery or not? It's not my responsibility. 
Zimov is tricky. You can't take him too seriously, but he's been vindicated often enough that you dismiss him at your own peril. He's up there, basically alone, pulling the levers that will reshape the largest terrestrial biome on Earth. It sounds crazy, but what if he actually does it? People are understandably nervous to intentionally do something that changes ecosystems, it changes the surface of the Earth. When you're intentionally doing something to manipulate climate, let's say, it, it falls under that heading of geoengineering. That's a term that freaks a lot of people out and they want no part of it. They don't want to play God, et cetera, et cetera. And yet there's no doubt the 7.4 billion people on Earth today are playing God whether they want to admit it or not. What about people who say no human should think they're intelligent enough to change an ecosystem? I agree. Our knowledge in ecology is so primitive and for us very difficult to establish new ecosystem. Therefore, I try to use only species from this ecosystem in territory where this ecosystem dominated a million years. Same territory, same soil, same climate, same species. There is no any engineering. It's just only reconstruction. I didn't have any freedom. I never will bring crocodiles here. Chickens are the species that seem most successful here. Zimov hates them. I think chickens are the least of his problems. So are, you, are you going, Sergei, to the cave? I not. I do it for you. If you don't need it, I will go. No, I would like to hear your explanation of the cave. It's interesting. For me, not. Why not? Response that you can hold cafe. Never slept with a dream before it had to go away. There's a bell in the tower, Uncle Ray bought around. Don't worry about the army in the cold, cold ground. Cold, cold ground. We built so deep cave for study of this sediment. Permafrost is beautiful conservation. Look, do you see these roots of grasses? Maybe middle Pleistocene. Oh. 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 And also we use this cave for storage of food. Before collapse of Soviet Union, I collect very big storage of everything. It was 10 years storage for just in case. He keeps saying, everybody, that he knew that Soviet Union would collapse and he was trying to prepare to that. Let's go. Okay. I don't know where they exit. I think you also don't know where they exit. It's not exactly a joke. It's only in half a joke. I had a few variants of prediction what will happen with Soviet Union and with world. Bad scenario. 
Very bad scenario. Very, very bad scenario. Absolutely terrible scenario and scenario which nothing to discuss. Finally realized only bad scenario. Why we try to predict something? Because good prediction help for surviving. I was seven when the system stopped functioning. Since I've been here more or less all my life, I would say that changes kind of ever touched me too much. So with Soviet Union collapse, my dad received the letter. Yeah. There is no more money for your research. So pack your bags and move back to your head institution, which is in Vladivostok. And my dad said, no, we are not doing that. I'm staying here and like, that's it. Only romantics survive here. I hunt, I catch the fish. We continue science research. Zima finally got what he wanted, total freedom. With no safety net, he leapt into the unknown. His country forgot about him, but global science discovered him. First big scientist who appeared here was Terry Chapin. And I was lucky to meet him. And this meeting provoked collaboration. I think my first visit there was in 1993 or so. At that time, I was just interested in carbon balance and dynamics of ecosystems. But his ideas were so interesting that I couldn't help getting drawn into the story that he was trying to tell. Why mammoths disappear? When I was young, the main theory was climate change. For me, it was necessary to show for scientists it's not true. This ecosystem disappeared not because climate change, but because it was pressure of humans. I didn't believe Sergei's arguments about it being human-driven, of human hunting of the megafauna in causing this change. And usually this meant each of us explaining and defending our logic fairly aggressively for hours and hours. And then we'd go out and walk around on the tundra. And he convinced me that there's a good possibility that his ideas might hold water. Oh, I have a homemade education. And I wrote very much books about everything. Therefore, I didn't have borders in my brain. And for me, it's so easy to do a hypothesis between different subjects. Global carbon side, greenhouse gases, climate change, glacial interglacial dynamic. Everything connected. Zimov pulled Chapin in with his theories about late Ice Age extinctions. Chapin, in turn, got Zimov interested in carbon how it moves around the biosphere, and the consequences for global climate. It was a perfect storm. One of the greatest minds of ecology, intersecting with this wild Russian with a head full of unorthodox ideas. He'd begun to do the calculations of what a huge reservoir of carbon was there, and the influence that this might have if it were returned to the atmosphere. I did very complicated research. I did multiplication. I multiplied one million square kilometer per 20 meter deep and per one percent never carbon contents. And I found 500 gigaton, huge reservoir 
carbon storage. Why I see, why other people did not see this? Enough. It was the most primitive discovery which I did in my life. It's absolutely primitive. If idea really strong, where you many months or years built with your brain and built so complicated construction, you can't quickly build the same construction in brain of other scientists. For 25 years, there was foreigners coming to our station, hundreds of them. Money starts flowing to the Arctic science. Big portion of that is because of my dad. These are not spicy, these are sort of spicy. When all these people come to do research in the Russian Arctic, the Zimovs take care of them. They feed them, they give them a place to sleep, they transport them to their research sites, and they keep their experiments running when the scientists go home for the winter. This is the family business. There are nine towers that Colin and I look after, and this one is the problem child. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> this way we are making money for living and for when the year is good, let's say, to invest in Poison Park. Ah, 13.25. And you didn't trust me? No, I did No, you did not. Because just because you said you've been having these problems, right? So. So what does this thing here do? The one we're exchanging it, it measures CO2 concentration. We want to replace it to ensure we have reliable data. And we have data at all, actually. First time I was climbing up this tower, I was freaking scared. And now it's like, huh? Whatever. <laughs> I got it. Okay. It's critical that permafrost carbon become incorporated into the models to meet our climate change goals. If we don't consider carbon from permafrost thaw, then we're not going to meet that target. This really blew me away. All the predictions about global warming, the models don't yet include permafrost. People like to accuse climate scientists of alarmism, but if anything, after decades of getting battered for any sign of uncertainty. They've been overly cautious. When I start idea about Lyson Park, it was not connected with global warming. Then I add important position. Permafrost will melt. There is only one theoretical chance to mitigate this melting. How this animals survive in winter? They do the same, they eat grass. But if you're going to eat this grass in winter, in first you must excavate snow and disturbed snow, it's very good thermal insulator. What animals do? They disturb the snow cover. They excavate. And soil quickly freeze. Our measurements show in place where the big density of animals, temperature of permafrost, 4 degrees centigrade, colder compares with place where animals are absent. So animals actually making permafrost much colder and keeping this huge carbon reserve, which is now under our feet, intact. Zimov actually came up with three ways restoring his ecosystem would affect climate change. Snow trampling would keep permafrost cold. Less trees would mean more solar energy reflects back into space. And finally, like they did during the Ice Age, these grasslands would suck carbon from the atmosphere and store it in the soil. This wouldn't single-handedly solve climate change, but it would limit it to a bad scenario and avoid the unspeakable scenario. 
А бачки, вот видите, А бачки белые. слабенькие, да. Не, ребят, ну, это готово то, что это белое, но белое нет. Ну, что ты? Да. When I left Siberia that year, I took the long way home, south, through Mongolia. It was hard not to see the world a bit differently. In Mongolia, yaks and goats and horses do the job their Ice Age ancestors did. Grasslands and herbivores are interdependent. Zimov's idea is a masterpiece of speculative science. Reality proved more complicated. Казино, чтобы он здесь не снимал. И вообще, Кит, в этот жуткий бардак возить людей с камерой. The park seems stuck, stagnating. Those insane trips to get animals, that all happened before I got here. I don't have the patience to be a good, objective fly on the wall. When nothing's happening, I get this urge to stir the pot, generate some action. What, what if you took 100 horses and drove them here overland in winter, like a Wild West cattle drive, but through the snow on a frozen river? That would be cinematic. Like, you can take them. You have to buy them. Okay, so you buy them. And they're like, each horse is a thousand bucks. Do you have extra hundred, hundred thousand? I don't. Sergey, do you have actual deep permafrost data on grazing effect yet? Like, it needs more research from somebody, right? I can't do all research because I need sleep four hours per day. Even if it's crazy, it's important enough that it's worth further investigation. I will go to home. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Home. I will do scientific theory. Why I successful? Because I can choose main priorities. If I something not do, it means it's not first priority. I not so much worry about permafrost. Permafrost will strongly melt in 10 years. I'm not sure modern empire will survive so long time. Were there any new animals born this year? This year we actually minus one horse, three horses died. Well, two disappeared and one little kid was, I think was killed by a male. I would prefer nature not to notice our activity for a little while longer. Because I feel like I know what we do and trying to prevent us from succeeding. Это дискуссии, все это дискуссии, деньги. Каждая эта труба, каждый запар, какие-то это все деньги. Если эти расходы не приносят дохода, то это все из моего кармана. Нет самого. I cannot do more than I already did. 
we are running like a super incredibly unprofitable business in the most unprofitable place. And we are kind of spending all the money on the park. Our responsibility is scientific research. Most of this job is done. Does it look like done? In my opinion, there is almost nothing done. Get in. Let's go. How much of your life have you dedicated to this park, Nikita? What is it? How much of your life have you dedicated to this park project? Apparently, most of it. Are you done? What do you mean? Well, it seems like your father is done. Have you done what you want to do here and are finished, or there's more you want to do? His wife now is not the most exciting thing to film. He's just sitting by the sofa and thinking about physics. Day and day and day. Going to sleep, have coffee, then go to smoke, then lay down again, then lay some more. He's getting old. One day, back at home, I was working with my editor. I got a message from Nikita. Luke, I will do Kickstarter. I need video. You have hundreds of hours of footage of me that you've done nothing useful with. You will make video. Hello, my name is Nikita Zimov. I am the director of the Bison in Park. With the money we raised from this campaign, we will buy a small herd of bison, plus a herd of yaks. Like, I am not a professional actor. That was super cheesy. We are rapidly approaching tipping point when warming becomes unstoppable. We must take actions now. If you want to join... When did you tell your dad about the Kickstarter? I think like a couple of weeks after we finished. Maybe he was slightly offended that I didn't tell him from the start. Why did you wait to tell him? I wasn't sure he will, he is going to approve this method of collecting the money. I think when, if you would tell him from the start, he would say that it's a bad idea. But when I come and say, that, oh, you know, that I found some money, <laughs> that sounds way better.
Nikita had arranged to buy both bison and yaks. As he was getting everything ready for the trip, the people with the bison stopped answering his calls. It turned out they were on the run from the law and had fled the country. The bison were impounded by the cops, and the cops had no interest in negotiating with Nikita. So, we had yaks, but no bison. Don't do that! You gotta be very gentle. Why? You will be able to pick it up and throw it up there. But you wanna put it back? I didn't understand that. That was not clear, Nikita. Не, люк на самом деле работящий все. На самом деле для человека, который никогда нигде не работал, люк поразительно работящий. This is the point when I realized my position in the hierarchy of Pleistocene Park had been once again upgraded. First, fly on the wall. Then, annoying buzzing fly. And now my status was yak shit shoveler, third class. Crossing Siberia the long way, overland, our 10 yaks look increasingly small and pathetic. So do we. But Pleistocene Park is finally picking up some momentum. I guess I'm skeptical about the possibility of it actually being something that could move across the Arctic getting the globe to decrease their carbon emissions is probably more of something that's going to impact future climate. But, you know, obviously we're not doing that either, so. The more climate change rolls down the road, the fewer options we have. So science is going to have to suggest some radical interventions for the long-term future of humanity. We can't afford not to do those experiments. Is it realistic? Is it realistic to restore large herds of big animals over millions of square kilometers? I don't know. It's never happened before. Humans can wipe them out. Can we help bring them back? I'm not sure. There's arrogance in all really big ideas. And it's a big idea, and Zemoff's got arrogance. It, it, nothing would ever happen on this scale without the combination. You think we're going to make it all the way to some Shen running on half our cylinders? Roma thinks that it will continue driving just at the higher fuel consumption. 
Probably will drive as long as it drives. The big truck is slowly disintegrated. So, nothing good. Он напарник по опасному бизнесу. Давай не будем загадывать, где мы будем да. завтра вечером. Мы едем по мере наших сил и возможностей. Вот я не знаю, я, я, я всегда загадываю. Не надо. Не надо. Это плохая примета. Не знаю. Как загадаешь, потом ничего не Если выпадет. Это плохая примета, я, я бы зову сдох. Вот я тебе примерно говорю, что после завтра это основной элемент. После завтра примерно, примерно плюс минус. А если ты загадываешь, завтра где-то в Сибирь. We just passed the ridge, which is dividing Kalama and the Dikirka River watersheds. So now we are already in the Kalama River watershed. Basically almost home. No, just 2,000 kilometers from home, but... So we're like eight days and maybe ten until they get to the park? Yeah, I will not make big predictions. As hard as this is, as much as they struggle against the universe to make any headway, this could only happen in Russia. In America, even if you were a billionaire, you wouldn't even attempt something like this. It wouldn't be allowed. Attache cases are useless. Scotch Guard Macintoshes shall be carbonized. Zimov skipped the tedious part of bringing yaks, raising money, logistics, driving, but managed to show up for the final leg, contingent of paparazzi in tow. Вот это наш контейнер, то что едет к нам на станцию. Вот это, соответственно, яки, которых мы везем в парк. Это единственная рогатая. Ну не знаю. Первый класс. Мы чем дальше на север, тем лучше седы. Да. В Иркутске нам продали просто съед... солому несъедобную, которая там, знаешь, вот эти, как, как называется, из нее плевались. Да, то есть они просто бедные измучились. То есть вообще, ну, не едят, но в основном их кормили а, то есть, этим автобом. Вот. Зеленую горошку купил в акваганах, сенверную. Мы сами, так сказать, не едим. Гриша, следующий. Хоп, хоп, хоп. Прям злостный такой. Надо как-то получить, чтобы управлять мяком. Они не выйдут. 
Да, ну, нулевая мотивация, мотивация выходить. Мотивация. Хм. Кит, не, не двигай, не, не пугай, он сам уйдет. Слава, подожди сейчас. Each week I do reintroduction of new species. Therefore, it's not super happiness if you do it each week. Are you happy you finally got him here? Uh, I don't know. I feel kind of empty right now. It's been totally six months since we started doing that. And now finally, let's say, second stage out of three is done. So first stage was to collect resources to bring yaks. Second stage was to bring yaks, which is now officially finished. And now we are up for the stage three, make sure this yaks adapt to this new place. Ooh, Sarah. Getting 10 yaks to Pleistocene Park felt like such a heroic effort. But Nikita needs 10 million bison, and he can't get past one. How this guy learned to, to play with uh, pieces of wood, it's very clear he, that he needs some female company. He's evolutionating way too fast. What monkeys took you know, millions of years to become humans. This guy learned in five years in the park. You know, that's what lack of females doing with humans. <laughs> too much thinking, too much thinking. They have a chicken and egg problem. They need animals to create grassland, grasslands to support animals, and an ecosystem with both to freeze the permafrost. They need evidence it's working to raise money, but they can't afford enough animals to test it. None of this seems to bother Zimov much. Any herbivores must prepare pasture for his children. How increase volume of pasture? You must kill trees. It's his hobby. It's his genetically hobby. Okay. Kill one hundred trees and your children will find enough grass. More grasses, more food, more animals, more animals, more excrement. Better soil, grasses grow faster. All history, our civilization fight with wild ecosystem. It's enemy for us. For, for our insistence, it was enemy, enemy. Now I do propaganda. Let's stop this war. Any species must have freedom. Democracy must be not only between the humans, but between all wild of our planet. After Zimov's experience with the bison dying their first winter, Nikita treated his yaks like little princes and princesses. He built them a barn, he fed them grain, he even heated their drinking water. Now, if they can get away with it, they just hang up by the barn and beg for food. I'm just going to back a couple steps. Yeah, um, yeah a little bit over this way, please. A little over here. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Are you kidding? You're going to come a little bit this way, I think. To have room yeah. for your dad, right? Yep. You're trying to bring the animals back now. How can you do that? 
Физически или морально? Или финансово? CBS 60 Minute News came this year and they will be in the water. Maybe that will make a big splash. 60 Minutes is a huge deal. Media attention raises hopes that they'll attract some big time donors. But it also puts a lot of pressure on Nikita and his little menagerie to save the world. So, uh, whose grave are you digging, Nikita? You do. <laughs> if, if you don't put the camera down and take the shower in your hand in the next like, five, ten minutes, that will be your grave. <laughs> Nikita thinks I'll never finish this documentary. Luke, making this movie has become lifestyle for you. You might be right. I started dating a woman I met traveling through Russia. In fact, we just got married. When I got back home, I was like, you know, maybe I could find Nikita some bison. I know there's some somewhere in Alaska. And if you look at a globe, Alaska and Pleistocene Park are incredibly close together. Luke found a tribe in Alaska which own lots of bison and they are willing to sell some of them. I was rather pleased with myself. Participant observation is a slippery slope. Nobody had ever done this from Alaska before. I had to set up a temporary USDA quarantine facility at the bison farm. I got Fairbanks International Airport designated a livestock exportation port, and I got crates built. So it was a huge nightmare to get all the permissions, all the regulations. So bureaucracy like veterinary service in the United States is insane. And we got the bison, we got them quarantined, we got all the tests, and everything was set. The only thing that was troubling us was that air companies kept flaking on us. And it's just like a money drain. Now our cages is probably already too small, and we'll have to redo the cage. Thousand bucks each. <sighs> our bison stuck in quarantine. I found a fly-by-night operation with an 80-year-old DC-4. The pilot seemed a bit squirrely, but said he was cowboy enough to fly bison to Russia. He wasn't. Three days before our scheduled flight, he said it was too risky and he wouldn't do it. Once again, no bison for us. I wanted to firebomb an airplane. I think this is the biggest thing I've ever screwed up in my life. I didn't screw it up alone. It was a collaborative effort, but still. What's like in your lifetime could you really see happening if you had like not unlimited, but like really, really serious money and a lot of resources like. Yeah, yeah. Look, let's say maybe if you would be asking me four years ago, five years ago, I would answer you this question. I would say like, oh, in 40 years from now, we will have that number, that number, and that number. But over the experience run in the park, I learned that every projection will fail, something will go wrong. And I don't want to speculate on that. I'm not going to give you a number. Ask my dad. I believe in this theory, and I choose place for living, which connected with my theory. All my buildings stand or in the rock, or in high cliff, or in the barge. I have very big experience in surviving. Most of people in Europe or America don't have experience for surviving. They never had this problem. Yuck. Do you see black? The Zimovs have already begun rebuilding the ice age. 
un immense laboratoire à ciel ouvert. The vision of media and regular people on the park was always kind of more developed than the rates at which we can develop the park ourselves. Oh, dog. Dog. What's this? Come here. What's this? If Nikita is short on animals to populate the park, he does have great thundering herds of film crews. Yes. It's like there's two places to see parks. One, mostly mud and mosquitoes. The other is a kind of modern day epic myth built by the media and the collective imagination of people living far away. Whoa! Awesome! It's a fever! It's still frozen. Oh, yeah. It's still icy. <laughs> the guy who wants to win to win today wants me to say that mamas will save the world, and I'm not going to save that. What mama? George Church, the mammoth resurrecting Harvard geneticist, Kevin Kelly, the founding editor of Wired magazine, and Stuart Brand, 60s countercultural icon turned tech thought leader turned prophet of long term thinking, came on a fact finding mission to Pleistocene Park. I've been much quoted as saying, We are as gods and might as well get good at it. I think since climate change became a major issue, I'm now saying we are as gods and have to get good at it. Brand and Kelly are revered in Silicon Valley. Brand and Church have been partnering on a project to reverse engineer a woolly mammoth. This looks like the hip socket, maybe? Yes. Of what, though? It's mamas. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh my goodness. Oh, that's a great one. It followed me home. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Are these pure yet? Yeah? Uh, I think that the white, white, the white one. Yeah. It was sold to me as a pure yak. But that's, I don't, I don't think so. Yeah, the the black ones are more pure. That's for yeah. sure. There. Yeah. Yeah. Are all the animals that you have breeding in one way or another? Well, if it's uh, if they have different genders, yes. My responsibility prepare ecosystem for mammals because mammals never live alone. Mamas have chance of surviving in nature only if nature will be mamas step ecosystem. I need just only 1,000. 1,000. For my grandchildren, it will be necessary around 1 million. 1 million, okay. The most complicated story it will be for first mama. Yeah. We will do competition. Who will be first? Or my parks will ready, or your... My embryos. <laughs> It's only one problem, we are not so young. Well, there is aging reversal. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's and mean we have only five years. It might take a little more than five years. I think we have more than five years. Climate temperature grows and melting of ice wages start everywhere. I will show you. I was always stating that permafrost degradation will happen 10, 20, 30 years. And you know, like in some places, apparently it's happening this year. We accidentally found it, measured carbon content in the soil in active air in April here in the, in the park and outside of the park. And then my dad got super excited. Even those towers indicated elevated CO2. Usually it was like that. Last year it was like that. And this year it's like that. So it's like very sharp. Permafrost is degrading. That's a fact. This machine is like risky. Things sometimes explode. Stuart Brand says, we are now as gods and we might as well get good at it. Arrogance got us into this situation, and I doubt arrogance is going to get us out. But at some level, he's undeniably right. My worries about Zimov replacing Arctic ecosystems for the sake of a crazy idea? Climate change is already doing it. 
The Arctic as we know it is lost. The question is, does it transform with Zimov's animals or without them? Most important break mind of people. But what's the main problem? Scientific community is so conservative. They don't need to change this mind. Old paradigm disappear only when last participants of this paradigm died. Some unsolicited advice showed up on our Facebook page. You should get bison from this farm in Denmark. People have no idea how big Russia is. Denmark's the opposite side of the planet from Pleistocene Park. I called the farmer anyway. Why not? Here they are. So I think the plan is three males, nine females, right? Yeah, probably three. an eight. Uh, three and nine, no? No, one eight, one eight. Are you sure? <laughs> Today we have around 400 bison, and I expect to have a uh, hundred more babies this year. Maybe then next time, if you're going to pick some up here, uh, you need more than 12 eggs. <laughs> it would take many, many years before you have uh, 20 million from this group from, uh, from 12. And now we have the 100% control about the Russian. Yeah, now it's time to uh, the, the boy had been discuss the price nice. again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a little bit more sophisticated than your truck, Nikita. <coughs> yeah, a little bit. Are you sure you can uh, separate them 4, 4 and 4? And especially in the combination you need them. Yeah. Bison look very nice, like a real bison. Uh, we are somewhere in Germany. How can we get this letter to the custom? At the border with Russia, we met up with Zimov, two Russian truck drivers, and Nikita's luxury bison RV. Nikita insisted that the bison should be transported each in separate stalls, so they wouldn't hurt each other. Nils, the Danish bison farmer, told us, bison are herd animals. They won't be happy if they're not together. They'll die within three days if you separate them. <laughs> Maybe my experience with bison not so big, but I never saw so nice bison before. Did you see they're all lying down, Nikita? Huh? They're all lying down. Is it good? I think it's good. 
Well, no one is. Fortunately, Niels overestimated the stress level. At the end of the first day driving, it was clear that Nils did not overestimate the stress level. Some were facing the wrong way in their stalls. They couldn't eat and they couldn't drink. Also, bison kick savagely. It's like loading a hair trigger catapult. Nikita called his dad. Not surprisingly, Zimov had an idea. Now I'm a bit worried about, them, about mosquitoes, about how well they will deal with the cold, about how uh, European bison which you have in the park and make sure they don't kill each other. Stopped. I shouldn't have. Extremely pronounced. So everywhere we go, the ice will just melt. Modern civilization will die soon, together with last barrels of light oil. Because modern civilization is civilization of cheap light oil. It will finish next week. If people will be same stupid, chance surviving of our civilization is very small. Modern civilization is civilizations of things which survive just few years. Who will live in building where you live in 30 years? No one. It will break. It's a real hard sell. My conception will help. It's done. And I'm riding to meet you on a 
brown gray speckled man But there's something that amends me Like I'm riding up the air These fuel deaths to serve me Thinking no one really cares And I'm jumping over fences On this obstacle course But it seems I'm getting nowhere On the concept of the horse It's a real hard sell My conceptual hell Not even good for killing No one building say of Till midnight. Oh my god. Добрый вечер. А уже испортилось? Да, у что это гостиница. Они же даже не У них такой взгляд. взгляд. Это чубик, чубик-то. Это же не коровы. На халявый уксус лапки. За последние двое суток, по-моему, три бутылки в день. Дело, как понимаю. Что это, Никита? Internet cable. It's going probably all the way from Yakutsk to I don't know where. And it's like just laying along the road everywhere we stop. It's the most reliable source of internet, I'm sure. What could possibly go wrong, right? То есть, когда человек доходяга или автомобилю 40 лет, он сломается. В цивилизации рушится и какая-то замена новой появляется в мафтабе времени ну, 100 лет. Все, что связано с глобальным сегодняшним потеплением, это тысячи лет. Это всерьез и надолго. Luke, you were supposed to help me. Don't let your sense of humor abandon you. I told you to put it somewhere useful. Well, everything here is somewhat useful. Well, Zimov says that starting with a thousand bison, you can reach 10 million, enough to slow permafrost thaw in 30 or 40 years. It sounded so absurd I didn't really think about it much. But a Canadian biologist later told me bison herds in the Yukon Territory grew by 20% a year. Exponential growth is hard to fathom, but if you multiply it out, Zimov's close enough. 10 million bison in 52 years. We got more news. Nature magazine finally published a modeling paper by a German researcher, Christian Beer, and Sergei and Nikita. It concludes that reintroducing millions of herbivores to the Arctic could prevent 80% of permafrost thaw. <laughs> Это 
every single time you go and check what's going on, you're like standing and staring at you like, oh, nothing happened, we did nothing, it's not us. As you walk away, and there's like a nervous sounds, very loud, and like, boo! And the wall of the container, and like, ah, are they still alive out there? I think they are ready to be released. Let's say I am ready to release them in the park, let's put it this way. I think I find Pleistocene Park so attractive because it's so delicate, so fallible. Compared with other ideas to manage global warming, like spraying sulfates in the stratosphere, it's subtle. Modesty isn't one of Sergei Zimov's great strengths, but when nature has plans of its own, it imposes a little humility. It still seems improbable that this is going to save the world. I mean, look at us. But making obscure documentaries is also unlikely to save the world, or even pay the bills. Their odds are as good as any. Maybe I'm a pathological optimist too. Yeah, I'm always more nervous when something can go wrong at the very last moment. My nervousness was pretty much spread the duration of the entire trip. And now when there is just a few tens of kilometers left, like all my nervousness is getting like compact over this period of time myself. Сейчас вот Little bizonchiki. You guys are so close. You have no idea. Когда есть идея, додумать детали уже не сложно. Ну, что я могу сделать? Только доделать что-то хорошее и подготовить скрижали. Не на флешках, а на чем-нибудь солидном, как минимум на пергаменте. А еще лучше в легендах и мифах. Мой дед не всегда прав. But, you know, if you don't try, if you don't do anything, nothing is done. Today in the studio, we have the producer and director of Pleistocene Park, Luke Griswold Turgis. Welcome. Thank you. Before we get into the questions, there's like a bunch of scenes where you're discovering bones of woolly mammoths out of the kind of permafrost that's melting in Siberia. How old are those bones? Yeah, I think those are from 15,000 years ago, which okay. was the end of the Ice Age going back to like 60,000 years ago. And that cliff, there's like a cliff behind you there. So that cliff represents 40,000 years of accrued sediments. And you can, it's almost like tree rings. You can like read it right. like a book. So the bones coming out of the bottom of it are the oldest. And the bones up near the top of the cliff are like, you know, the newest right towards the end of the ice age, like 15,000, 12,000 years ago. So I don't know much about geologic eras, but wasn't the ice age like two and a half million years ago? It started two and a half million years ago and it went through a period of like warm spells and cold spells. So like right now the Holocene, or maybe we're in the Anthropocene, but it's uh, interglacial. It's like a warm spell in a period of ice ages. Like the ice age, the Pleistocene wasn't just ice ages. It was like warm up for 12,000 years and then cool off for 30,000 years. Don't quote me on the numbers. I'm also right. not a geologist nor a scientist. Right. It would kind of be cold, 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 and like warm up for a little bit, cold, 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 warm up for a little bit. So we're, you know, 12,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, one of these warm spells started. 
which should be ending in a couple thousand years, except for climate change. It's going the opposite direction and getting warmer. And what um, was it a big deal to be discovering these bones of woolly mammoths? To me, it was a big deal because you're just tripping over them on the beach. It's like this total, like, holy shit moment. And they're like, you know, big bones. Yeah. Like, it's like they're like driftwood on the beach. I think there's like a skeleton of mammoth out here. We already found like 20 bones. Those are all like finger bones there, right? Yeah, yeah. Each year, bones appear on the beach. We drive, we collect all bones. Many years, we did this collection. Now I wanted to be a dentist. It's a full collection. It means it's a good statistic example. So tell me, what is your background? I come from Northern California. I like lived like 12 miles out of dirt road with no running water, electricity with my mom and the goats and the chickens and the dogs. I went to UC Santa Cruz, studied cultural anthropology. And then after I graduated college, some friends of mine who were, um, there's like a group of anarchists squatting in the forest behind the university campus. And we all decided to ride freight trains up to Seattle and try to stow away on the barge to Alaska. Um, and they ended up like doing the stowaway thing without me. And so I like got a ride on a fishing boat first and then a sailboat the rest of the way to Juneau, where I met the subject of my first documentary. And it kind of happened by a happens chance. He's Native American and he wanted to record oral history. Or he, he wouldn't, didn't want to record it. He was just like obsessed with oral history in the sense that the people who know it aren't going to be able to pass it on. And I suggested like, well, you know, I just finished studying anthropology. Like you could do an oral history project. It would be cool. I bet you could get a grant for it or something like it sounds like a supportable thing. And so I was like, I can look into grants. And we started applying for grants and it sort of morphed into this documentary, which was my first film, Smoke and Fish. And after I finished that, it was like, oh, well, maybe this is my job now. Mm. So it was, it was kind of by happens chance that I ended up doing that. And how did you, you're self-taught with the cameras and this is a film that had drones and lots of gear. Like, how did you learn all of it? Trial and error. Mm, figured it out. Screwing up. <laughs> I screwed lots of things up. Right. Yeah, I actually wish that I had worked with more professionals. I think I would have learned a lot and not had to do so much trial and error. I think it's beautifully shot. You figured it out. So how long have you been working on the film? I started in 2013, so what, it's gonna be broadcast 10 years after I started. What was your original idea for the film and how did that evolve over the years? I thought I would go there, it would be crazy. I'd spend one season shooting some preliminary footage, go back, like edit a teaser, get like plenty of funding, because it to me seemed like a really high profile story. Come back the next year, finish it off, like edit it, like. I don't know, be partying at Sundance or something. <laughs> like, you know, year, by the end of year two. Uh, and of course, like, funding is never easy with films. So right. that was one thing that took a long time. And the other thing that took a long time is I showed up at a point when there just wasn't a lot happening in the project. You know, they, they weren't in this, like, manic phase of trying to create Pleistocene Park. They were a little bit stalled out and frustrated mm. and didn't want to admit it because they're, you know, proud, stubborn people. I don't have the patience to be a good, objective fly on the wall. When nothing's happening, I get this urge to stir the pot, generate some action. What, what if you took 100 horses and drove them here overland in winter, like a Wild West cattle drive, but through the snow on a frozen river? That would be cinematic. Like, you can't take them. You have to buy them. Okay, so you buy them. And they're like, each horse is a thousand bucks. Do you have extra hundred, hundred thousand? So you filmed everything yourself. Did you have a crew with you? No. I wanted to have a crew, but I could always afford to go back myself for another season of shooting, and I could never afford to take a crew with me. Yeah. And were you lugging? You were obviously taking all your equipment. Was it a lot of equipment that you were, like, transporting, you know, through Siberia? Yeah, what did I have? I had, I think, three big bags, like a backpacking backpack, and then, like, a kind of waterproof backpack I'd wear on my front and then like a carry-on bag that I'd sort of 
sling on top of that and a drone carrying the drone in its case. At one point I had this giant drone, like when I forget what it was, like the Inspire. It was the first sort of professional quality camera drone and it was like, you know, a box this big. Right. And so you start filming and then at a certain point you end up including yourself in the film. At what point did you make that decision? That was late in the game and uh, Maureen Gosling, the editor I worked with, and I made that call. You know, there's a thing if you, if you can't figure out how to tell your story, insert yourself in it, which is a little bit what I did. We were struggling conveying certain concepts and ideas and like key turning points that I just didn't have the Zimovs saying or explaining. And I, it also felt like it needed this layer to convey the feeling of what was going on. Because they're, they're Russian and they don't emote a lot. You know, they're, they're kind of stoic people. Mm. And so I think by explaining like where I was in the whole thing and like my own frustrations, I could convey some of the frustration of the process of what they were doing. I mean, I kind of like acknowledging the filmmaker. You know, you're never just like a fly on the wall. You're always influencing things that are happening. In this case, like, you know, I was bugging them to get on with it. So it made sense as part of the story, but you don't want to overwhelm, like it's about your subjects, right? It's not about you. Right. I mean, I guess there's like very good films where it is about the filmmaker and they're, you know, the self main character. That wasn't, you know, I was interested in my characters. Like, you see, you don't want to be too present and distract from them, but you also want to, I don't know, position things. But so it also added tone. some levity to the film as well. Like yeah. Their take on you, they're kind of like busting your chops and uh -huh. putting you to work and, and, and you're transparent about it. Like after all these years, all of a sudden, you know, like they need another boat driver, and, you know, whatever it is. So how did you first hear about Sergei in the park? I had finished up my first film. It's kind of like issues that had always obsessed me. And I was sort of thinking about a next project. And I read an article, I think in the Huffington Post about them. And I was just like, this is mind blowing. Like a crazy Russian. He, it didn't make it in the film, but he, because it, it was broken down by the time I got there, but he drives around in a tank. And he's like, it is my synthetic woolly mammoth. The only problem is it doesn't poop. You know, so you just like go tearing around in like those fields, knocking trees over with a tank. You know, it's just like, what's more cinematic than that? Right. Like, you, you know, look at the guy. Any herbivorist must prepare pasture for his children. How increase volume of pasture? You must kill trees. It's his hobby. It's his genetically hobby. Okay. Kill 100 trees and your children will find enough grass. More grasses, more food, more animals, more animals, more excrement. Better soil, grasses grow faster. It was a way to tell a story about climate change and things that are important, but without pounding on the same issues every film about climate change pounds on. But, you know, it's like a really different untold story that mm -hmm. still relates to important global issues. So I thought it would fulfill both those roles. And you said that you kind of just cold emailed them and they got back to you right away? Yeah, I uh, cold emailed Sergey, and I, um, at the time I didn't know that he doesn't touch his computer. So actually it was his wife that read the email and probably like, Sergey, like, what should we do about this? Right. Um, and then apparently Nikita, I like learned this years later, Nikita was like, no dad, we can't have a journalist come right now. Like the park is a mess. And Sergey just overruled his son and was like, nope, we will invite this journalist. So I showed up, Nikita picked me up at the airport. You fly in a propeller plane, it's a five and a half hour plane from the nearest town. It's just like, it's so remote up there. And so Nikita picks me up and he's just like, oh, my dad wanted this journalist? Like, here, let me drop you off at my dad's house and you can like, you can deal with it, dad. And like, I go to talk to Sergey, and Sergey is like, so what exactly do you want to do? And I'm like, well, I want to film the process of creating Pisces Park. Like you working, you doing science, you doing the things you do, bringing animals, building fences, like the, the process. I, and he's like, well, I can explain things to you, but like, I'm pretty busy. And I'm like, okay, well, explanations are good, but I want action, I want process. And he turns to me and he's like, you know, every day I wake up 
and I have a cup of instant coffee because chemically it's the same, so instant coffee is just as good as any other coffee. Then I smoke a cigarette. Then I sit on the couch and I think. Then I have another instant coffee and smoke another cigarette. And I keep thinking. Every day I drink 20 cups of coffee and I smoke 20 cigarettes and I sit on the couch and I think. If you can make a film about this, but it's gonna be extremely boring. And I kind of thought he was joking, but no, like every day he would sit on the couch all day long thinking and drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. His life now is not the most exciting thing to film. He's just sitting by the sofa and thinking about physics. Day and day and day. Going to sleep, have coffee, then go to smoke, then lay down again, then lay some more. He's getting old. And he kind of dumped me on Nikita. He was like, okay, Nikita, like take this journalist to the park. Oh, Nikita, like deal with this guy. He's bugging me, like. When you got there, did you have a what have I done moment? Like, why am I here? Like, what did I... Ima I imagine this was going to be a herd of bison and like all this stuff happening, but it's actually just like this Russian family living in the middle of nowhere with a couple chickens and, you know. Yeah, showing up in Russia, I had a what have I done moment of... I've traveled a fair bit and I thought like, oh, how, how difficult can it be to travel in Russia? Like I even started studying Russian a little bit and like actually showing up and being like, oh, wow, this is like not an easy place to navigate. Right. The Zimov's place is actually, there's a lot of international, you know, they speak English, both of them. Um, and their like families all speak English. And there's usually international, or there, before the war, there was always international scientists there like doing right. research. That's how they make their money is they have this research station. There are nine towers that Colin and I look after, and this one is the problem child. <laughs> Sorry for that. <laughs> this way we are making money for living and for when the year is good, let's say, to invest in Poison Park. Can you describe what the, the park is like in person? Yeah, you show up there and there's a pretty rickety fence. It's a like an hour and a half boat ride through these winding channels through the floodplain. Like if you look at it from the air, it's just like all these lakes and like channels meandering through, or, or even on Google Earth, it's kind of amazing to look at. The footage that you have of the winding waterways, it's beautiful. I was like, wow, I've never seen this part of Siberia before. It's absolutely gorgeous. In the wintertime, does it freeze over? Yeah, the whole thing freezes. You can actually drive there in the drive winter. There. It's like a, I don't know, a five day drive from the last road, just like driving on the frozen rivers. And in some places, I think the road goes over land. You know, so it's a winter road only. Nikita has done that trip multiple times. Right. I, um, I would have loved to do that trip, but I never had a, a chance to do it. Mm. Is it well maintained, the park? It's pretty funky. Um, you know, they did it all with their own money and usually their own labor. You know, like they actually were just out there building the fence themselves. Um, at some point with the tank, like, you know, hauling big rolls of wire with the tank, they have this machine, it's like a, a steam drill, it's like a big boiler, like a locomotive, and it has a hose coming out of it and like a metal pipe and you like stick it in the ground and like that melts the permafrost if, to make a hole to put in a fence post. These are different people. Uh-huh. Incredibly hard working and resourceful, but it's also like pretty next level to like commit like this. That and then you have Nikita kind of raising his like super cute kids and his wife and everybody just seems so cool and they all speak English. So I'm like, wait, what's going on here mm -hmm. with this family? I mean, so we're, how do they learn how to speak English? Nikita, I think, grew up speaking English because so many American scientists were coming ah. and visiting. So there was always, when he was a kid, there was always Americans. He lived in America for a little while. I think when he was in middle school, his father got like a position at Berkeley, not a position, but like a visiting scholar position. So Nikita went to middle school in, in Berkeley for okay. six months or a year or something. Did you end up with a lot of kind of, you know, amazing moments that didn't make the film? Yeah. A lot of, a lot of gold on the cutting room floor? And things that it's just like, how do you fit this into the story? Because it's like, it's interesting, but it's a tangent. And, right. You know, the film's already long and we had, like, Zimov has a whole second park he created near Moscow. Mm. And we had a really funny scene there because like, he was so pleased with himself. He was able to do a lot of the things he couldn't do in the Arctic. And it's a funny thing because it's the second park. It's, it's on agricultural, like abandoned agricultural land near Tula, which is like two hours south of Moscow. 
So it's actual fertile land, and it's really easy to transport animals there, but it's not on permafrost. Right. So it doesn't have the climate implications, and Zimov is kind of like, yeah, but I can show, you know, it just doesn't just apply to permafrost, this idea that animals would shape ecosystems anywhere on Earth before humans wipe them out, especially places that are fertile grain-producing regions. If it's like, if grain is growing there now, a lot of grass was growing there and supporting big animal populations before humans started growing grain there. Like any bread basket was full of animals, right. wild animals before it was a bread basket. And now none of those places have animals because they're completely, you know, they're valuable. They're completely occupied by people. He thinks he can stop permafrost from melting by restoring the Ice Age mammoth steppe ecosystem. He's thinking big, like converting the northern half of Asia, plus Alaska and most of Canada to grasslands full of roaming herds. Like a kind of woolly Noah's Ark, he started bringing animals back and releasing them in Pleistocene Park. He's trying to prevent all this carbon from being like released and, and greenhouse gases and, you know, holes in the ozone layer in Siberia. In Moscow, it's just like, well, having these animals is good. And... Yeah, it's more of like an experiment in rewilding and what nature could look like. And he's in some ways more passionate about that than about like saving the world. I think he's a bit jaded on saving the world at this point because... Is it kind of a calling card for him too, to have it in Moscow and like, so people could see like, oh, there's this guy who's doing this important scientific exactly. work. Exactly. And, and people could visit it easily. It's, it's marketing for, for Place to See yeah. Park. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, I just thought it was funny going there because he had done so much in such a... You know, he kind of accomplished more in two years there than he accomplished in like 20 years trying to do it right. in the Arctic. And he was so pleased with himself, like the sort of like, it was just cool to see him like, I have this footage of him carrying, he's got a puppy in his arm and like horses are like walking up to him and he's like, I don't know why, but he's carrying a ladder around. Like he's just like in this big open field, this like giant bearded Russian dude carrying a ladder over his shoulder and like a puppy in his arm and like horses are following him around. It's this right. like just really, I don't know, Dr. Doolittle bucolic right. scene. It's hilarious. My wife actually went with me to film that and she was really amused too. Right. He had this group of wild pigs that he had in a pen, they were babies. And he was like trying to get the puppy to play with the pigs. And then he like lay down in the pig pen and was like spoon feeding them, like, like sitting on his side. Like, it's like just such a ridiculous scene. <laughs> it was like, like literally like lying there on the ground with the pigs, like with a spoon of like Kesha, like, like Russian porridge. Like, and the pigs would want, run up to him and squeal. And he like spoon feed them each a bowl of, like a spoonful of like of, of porridge. And where did you sleep at the park? In the park, there's a little shack there. So I like a couple times spent the night there. Normally I would stay at the research station where they, you know, they had like a cook on staff, they had a big dining hall, they had like several rooms with bunk beds. So, you know, sometimes you'd be sharing a room with a couple other scientists. It's in this big building with a satellite dish on the roof. Right. And that's their like, you know, where they host people. They're sort so of- So you were pretty hotel. comfortable there? You had I, it was actually super comfortable, yeah. Electricity, running water. Yeah, it was more comfortable than where I grew up. Right. Like I had none of those You didn't things. have running water. <laughs> or electricity or a phone. Wow. Or, well, I mean, it was before the internet. So on some level, you know, having spent time making documentaries myself and going, you know, around the world to different places where I'm not always comfortable, let's say I'm in a jungle or in Africa or wherever it is, and, you know, I was thinking about you on, on these journeys, like, oh, this is, like, pretty next level. I'll go for a couple days or a week, but Luke has spent years on and off in these kind of, like, crazy situations but now you're telling me like how you grew up I'm like wait a sec this is probably just like not a big deal for you based on how you grew up yeah when I traveled alone in Russia it was certainly more challenging and I think culturally and emotionally more than physically to be honest you know the mosquitoes are pretty rugged up there that's something I had experienced a little bit in Alaska but nothing like that and there's moments where you understand why mosquitoes can literally make people insane can we get back to how you grew up again? Oh, it's sure. really not on, on the script, but I'm just curious. So how many years did you live in an environment with no running water, electricity? Until I went to college. Your whole life? Like yeah, well, whole... actually, my uh, senior year of college, I went to um, Sweden for a year as an exchange student. So, you know, until I was 16, I guess, and I went to finish high school in Sweden as a foreign exchange student. So you did like homework by candlelight or like how did we had, we had uh, kerosene lights right and then um, and some propane lights and that was like a system my dad installed when my dad and mom were still together and then at some point we had a really funky solar system mm. and uh, 
I, I had an electric train set in my dad's house. And I'm like, oh, DC electricity, I, this is it's easy. You just like connect wires together and like things come on. So I like wired up some lights for my mom for a long time in our uh, bathroom to turn the light on in the bathroom. There were just like two bare wires that were kind of bent into hooks and you'd like hook them together and the light would come on. And my mom was like so proud of me, like that didn't bother her at all. She was like, no, Luke figured this out. And was this um, due to financial circumstances or was it a choice that we're gonna live off the land in a way. I was just talking to a friend about this who uh, grew up in not exactly the same way, but like in similar circumstances. And she was pointing out that sometimes voluntary poverty becomes involuntary if it goes on long enough. So, you know, that was a, it was a decision my parents made to live there. Um, I don't think my mom was ever planning on carrying on that lifestyle as a single mom, but that was what she had. You know, she owned the house. So how many trips to Siberia did you make for the film in total? God, I want to say eight, or was it nine? I think it was eight trips over eight years. In the first trip you took, it, it took six days. You kind of have it on, on the map, right? So tell me about that trip. Um, so I, I traveled, I left Haines, Alaska, where I was staying, took a ferry to Juneau, the capital of Alaska, spent the night. From Juneau, I flew to Anchorage, slept in the Air, Anchorage airport, like under the big stuffed polar bear. Um, then in the morning, there is like at seven o'clock in the morning, there's this direct flight from Anchorage to Russia once a week. There was, that's like shut down now, um, run by Yakutian Airlines. And it flew me to Petropolis Kamchatsky. And there I got hustled to the other terminal, the domestic terminal. You know, the, the international terminal at Petropolis Kamchatsky is literally a tent. Because right. they get like one international flight a week. Right. Well, I guess two flights, because it would come from Alaska, then it would go to Japan, and then come back to Petropolis from Japan. So they'd, on one day, they'd do this trip to Alaska and Japan all in one wow. day and back. Wow. Um, on like a 737 or something. And then I like, you know, this is like a normal, modern, like any other airplane you would fly on. And then they like hustle me over to the other terminal. Um, and I like, they put me on this other airplane. It's like this really funky from the 50s, probably, propeller plane, uh, Antonov 24, uh, with like all the seats are like lawn chairs. Right. And we take off and the flight attendant like offers me caviar. He's like eating caviar in the back of the airplane. He's like offering me caviar and like, we stop in Magadan, which is kind of the gateway to all the gulags. There were a lot of passengers on the plane? No, it was half empty. Right. We had like an eight hour layover in Magadan. Um, and I like got out and walked around and eventually like was hungry and like found the, like I think I texted my mom and my mom was like, I think piva is how you say beer in Russian. She'd right. like traveled to the Yugoslavia in the 60s. Like piva, piva, like, okay, I need to find a beer. And I like wander into this place, like, is this a restaurant? You know, like it's just this big padded door because like to keep the cold out. And like the whole flight crew is sitting in there like eating and stuff and they like, you know, help me order and whatnot. Right. And then like eight hours later, the, like the public transit in Magadan, there's like these huge off-road trucks are just like rolling through town. Wow. <laughs> with like a bus back on them. Yeah, and then they flew onwards to Yakutsk. I got stuck in Yakutsk for three days because the onward flights to Chersky kept getting canceled. Colin Edgar, who's a a um, technician from UAF, I ended up meeting him there. He was also stuck trying to get to Pleistocene Park. And he shows up briefly in the scene at top of the, the top of the tower. Right. He's the guy that would come there and maintain the tower. So we hung out and he like spoke a little bit of Russian because he'd been coming there for a while. And we wandered around Yakuts together um, and then ultimately made it to Pleistocene Park and got picked up by Nikita. And that in itself is an epic adventure. Russia's funny because it's pretty, it feels pretty, impenetrable and hard and like whoever's supposed to be helping you is just like well it's not really my problem like wh whoever the official is is invariably like really unhelpful and just when you think you're going to starve to death or get lost or something some totally random person like an old lady like who doesn't speak a word of english will like come yell at them and like make them help you like someone always comes to your rescue somehow right it's like this funny thing of like you're like this lost foreigner and someone right. will eventually like Right, take right, pity right. on you and feed you and make sure you're okay. So your role evolved from, you know, documenting, documenting, being an observer, fly on the wall, to okay, now I have to like drive some boats for these guys, to oh, now I'm like shoveling yak shit, and now I'm like trying to like 
transport buffalo, you know, or bison to um, to, to the park. Um, how did your role change, you know, and like, how did it evolve for you? Well, early on, I kind of realized that if I could be helpful, I would get to go on trips. Because they've got a lot of people there, and they're always somewhat frantic, trying to, like, these scientists need to go here, this journalist needs to go there. They also got a lot of journalists come. You know, there's like, they're on these little speedboats, and there's limited room, and sometimes one more person is just, like, a hard thing to do. And so, but if I could drive the boat, that meant they actually needed me, and I could go on, like, all the trips and get to see interesting things. Like, there's another place that didn't make it into the film, or barely made it into the film, called Ambarchik, which is up on the Arctic coast, and they have some monitoring equipment up there. It's actually the site of a gulag, and it was the transshipment place where ships would come in and they'd like move the stuff to barges and stall in times. And there's a weather station up there and there's like, you know, three people and a dog and a cat, or three people, three dogs and a cat that live up there. And the Zimovs are like, you know, they get a helicopter resupply once a year. And other than that, the Zimovs are the only, their only connection with the outside world. Right. And so like, you know, we would go up there to maintain the equipment up there and it just like blew my mind every time. Wow. You're past the tree line, you're like just looking out over the Arctic Ocean. Sometimes we'd go up there and there'd still be ice on the ocean and you couldn't like go any farther. It's just like it's totally the ends of the earth. And the crazy thing about Ambarchik is you'll look on a globe of the world, like a random American globe, and you'll see it there. Right. Like it's like, it's three people and three dogs and yet it's on like the world map or the globe. Like it's, because it's the only thing up there. And did you enjoy spending all that time up there? I actually did, yeah. yeah. Research station was always interesting because there's always, you know, it's fun hanging out characters. with scientists. Yeah. yeah, there's always characters coming through. There's always grad students there. There's usually like a pretty young crowd also of like people that were fun to hang out with. So there's like, it's a little bit of like a summer camp or party scene. Right. Uh, it's like showing up at college or something where like everyone, you know, people don't know each other. So people make friends quick. The Zimovs provide unlimited beer and vodka also. People <laughs> Nikita's big competition is Tulik Lake, which is a research station run by the NSF in Alaska, um, and Nikita, which is much bigger and, you know, frankly, it's just like a bigger, fancier facility. And Nikita's always like, well, my son is better than Tulik Lake, and they don't have free beer. Right. Right. He's very competitive with Tulik Lake. There's got to be a, a camaraderie as well there, like, hey, we all made it here. Mm -hmm. and comparing notes on the journeys and all that, mm -hmm. I'm sure that was the thing. Mm -hmm. That's like a little club. And trying to do Arctic science is challenging, like, yeah. you know, knee deep in the mud and the mosquitoes, like hiking through the tussocks, riding, like, you know, those boat trips are actually pretty dangerous. Like at one point, we got like, you know, a wave like clear over our windshield. Those like the wind can kick up on that. Yes, a big river, it's like miles wide in places mm -hmm. and storms can kick up. Like they've, we never got shipwrecked, but Sergei and Nikita and groups of American scientists have just like gotten literally shipwrecked. Really? For sometimes for days where like their boats are all washed up on the shore by a storm. They can't get them back in the water. They lost their like, they had some four wheelers they'd taken up there and the four wheelers got washed overboard. You know, they were like pinned down for days. Like they've gotten like stuck in fishermen's camps where they're like all sleeping under the table, like a whole bunch of American scientists. It's gotta be terrifying at times too when that kind of thing happens, right? Or do you always know like somebody's gonna come rescue us or? You don't know someone's gonna come rescue you there. Right. I think like for other people, if something goes wrong, it's probably the Zimovs who are gonna come and rescue right. them. There's not a lot up there. And all, I mean, the water is like, you know, things can go wrong really quickly on the water. So your, your road trip from Denmark to Siberia was very long, 30 plus, maybe 35 days. Tell me about that. I actually called the farmer in Denmark. Um, I forget, someone on the, I was like managing Nikita's Facebook page at some point too. Right. Where I set up their Facebook page and some uh, Swedish fellow was like, oh, there's, a, there's bison in Denmark. And I was like, that's, like people just don't understand geography. That's ridiculous. Like, right. And then Nikita, and like, but I just like called the guy and was like, hey, like, you have bison and he's like yeah like are you willing to sell them like how much would they cost and nikita got super excited because nikita realized that this was something he could do himself and wouldn't need to be dependent on like other people that would flake on him right 
And I was pretty worried those animals weren't going to survive the trip. Because you know, in America, you can have animals in like livestock in transit for like 24 hours, maybe it's 48 hours. It's like it's a very limited amount of time. Um, per the law. Yeah, per the law. So you, know, you couldn't have done that in America. And actually, we had to get them out of the EU for the same reason. Right. And I think the reason they did well is they had a lot of space. They could move around, they could lie down. We stopped and we gave them food and water like you know, twice a day. So you know, they didn't get much exercise, but they, it wasn't like an American cattle truck where they're just like packed in there. Well, it was also interesting, the Danish farmer said, if you, keep, if you separate them, they will die after three days because they're herd animals. Yeah, that was really frustrating. And, but I mean, ultimately we, like, we put them back together. We like, yeah. cut out the dividers. Yeah. And it's like another case of like Nikita being really resourceful and just like, okay, this has to happen. How are we going to so do it? So he listened to the farmer when the farmer said, they're going to die unless you... Do no, it. we left and Nikita's like, no, I'm going to do it my way. We and it. we got like a day into the trip. You know, the Russian border, we transferred them to Nikita's truck. Right. Um, in a day and it was like, no, this is not, this is absolutely not working. And Nils, the farmer is right. They are going to die. And so we had to um, unload the bison from the container into a dump truck. Somehow, like Nikita, Sergei found a, had, knew a guy with a dump truck, and we like herded the bison out of the container into the back of this dump so truck, insane. which was the exact same so height as the, as the shipping container. Yeah. And then um, Nikita just like, got in there with a chainsaw and like cut the dividers out. At the end of the first day driving, it was clear that Nils did not overestimate the stress level. Some were facing the wrong way in their stalls. Mm -hmm. They couldn't eat and they couldn't drink. Also, bison kick savagely. It's like loading a hair trigger catapult. Nikita called his dad. Not surprisingly, Zimov had an idea. worried about mosquitoes, about how well they will deal with the cold, about how uh, European bison should have in the park to make sure they don't kill each other. I got really nervous in that scene because I, I thought it was very ominous because you, the farmer gives the advice, Nikita doesn't listen, you put them into individual compartments and mm -hmm. I was like, oh great, now the, all the bison, are they going to die? Mm -hmm. You know, I was like getting like emotionally prepared for that. Yeah, I don't know what I would have done if one of them had died on the trip too. It's like, yeah. it's like, it's messed up when animals die, especially like in captivity and yeah. transit. So I'm like, I, you have no idea how glad I am that they all like came out of that trip okay. Yeah, so climate change is obviously a, a trans-border global issue. Um, with the war, with Ukraine right now, Russia is becoming increasingly isolated. How is that affecting the park? What impact, what, what impact is the war having on the park? Uh, yeah, one of um, Nikita's workers got mobilized. Maybe more than one at this point. Really? Yeah. So that's a problem. The, so when the war started, like on day three of the war, all the European collaborators just like cut all ties and all funding. And there were some experience, experiments going on that had been going on for 20 years with like, you know, probably had cost millions of dollars at this point to run these experiments. 15 years, 20 years, when you with towers measuring CO2 and methane fluxes coming out of a swamp, and that just got cut off. You know, it's like these things like this, they have a generator running 24 hours a day, like year round to keep this stuff going. And that just like was done like three days into the war. No more funding for it. Nikita kept the equipment running for several months. He might still have it running. So these are, are were programs being funded by other European countries, yeah, by governments. Was, yeah. Who were funding scientists. Yeah. So it wasn't the scientists who were like, shut it down. It was the governments who were like, you're done. I don't know exactly how the decision was made, like where in that like spectrum, but it was universal for European institutions where just like, this is done, like no more. Um, there was a big group from Oxford that was planning on 
There's been a lot of research on climate change that they've done, and very little like actual research in Pleistocene Park until recently. And this group from Oxford got a quite big grant to do. You actually test Zimov's hypothesis in Pleistocene Park and install some of this equipment there. And they were supposed to be there this summer, and they couldn't go. So <clears throat> that's been a big impact. Meanwhile, they were starting some new projects with American funders. And Nikita was kind of in despair, and he's like, OK, like everything is over. Like, and I might never be able to leave Russia again, or like ever, you know, meet my collaborators again. And then he gets this like an email from one of the American groups saying like, "Hey, are you going to send us that invoice?" I'm like Nikita, send them the invoice right now, like today. Like, right. like stop talking to me. Like send them the invoice. What are you doing? Why are you waiting? So. And they got paid. So they've been getting paid by Americans still. And, you know, there's a strong argument that this is really important research yeah. that you know, the Zimovs aren't responsible for the war. Yeah. And they're doing something that's globally important. It's pretty important to keep this going. And how has it been affecting their morale? Have you spoken to them since the conflict started? You obviously have. Yeah, I've talked to Nikita quite a bit. Um, I mean, I, Nikita's pretty tough and a bit fatalistic. So he's kind of, they're in survival mode. Right. And they're doing what they have to do to pull through and keep the park going. It, like, it helps a lot. They still have some income source. He's been trying to like, find any way, any other way to like, generate income. Like he's, he has some trucks that he was used to haul animals that he bought the trucks. And he kept the trucks and has been like, leasing them out or renting them out, hauling supplies to some like, copper mine like, farther into the interior. You know, so he's just trying to figure like, any way possible to keep his world afloat which I think, you know, is kind of a brave thing to do. And then at some point I got a, like a video message from his wife, Nastia, and she's like, we're all, you know, I sent them the, a copy of the final film. Um, and she's like, we're all sitting down to watch your film. And she kind of like pans around the whole family and everyone, because they're Russian, no one is smiling. They all just have these like extremely serious looks <laughs> on their face. And I'm just like, oh shit, they're never going to talk to me again. And then I uh, don't hear from them from several days and I'm like, oh no. Oh no, they're just, it's over. They're never going to talk to me again. And then I like, finally I look at my messages and I realize they'd missed a, a message from Nikita. There was something along the lines of like, well, Luke, I must admit, your film was much better than I expected. Although perhaps I had extremely low expectations. <laughs> Which is as good of like a compliment that you're going to get compliment. from Nikita. <laughs> uh -huh. So they liked it. They liked it. I think yeah. they're happy with it. That's great. And so what's your take on it as far as, uh, you know, an experiment in speculative science, the hypothesis, do you think it could work? I think it could work. Um, like it, it makes sense to me and there's evidence supporting it. You know, to conclusively say it's going to work requires more science. But you think the, the Zimovs are right? I think they could be right. I mean, I don't, you know, I, like, I don't know what the future holds, right? Like, yeah. I'm not even a scientist, and even scientists argue about this. So it needs to be tested further. But simultaneously, if you want to really do it, you kind of need to start doing it now if it's going to take 40 years to pull off. Right. So there's this kind of quandary. I mean, the positive thing is there's, like, other benefits other than mitigating climate change to restoring animals in right. the Arctic. So, you know, like, for local people, for example, it's food security more animals to hunt, like in mm. places like Alaska. And they actually have been restoring wood bison in Alaska. Right. And one of the arguments is that for rural communities, this will be, you know, in indigenous communities, this is a source of food for them. Yeah. Zimov says that starting with a thousand bison, you can reach 10 million, enough to slow permafrost thaw in 30 or 40 years. It sounded so absurd, I didn't really think about it much. But a Canadian biologist later told me, bison herds in the Yukon Territory grew by 20% a year. Exponential growth is hard to fathom, but if you multiply it out, Zimov's close enough. 10 million bison in 52 years. We got more news. Nature magazine finally published a modeling paper by a German researcher, Christian Beer, and Sergei and Nikita. It concludes that reintroducing millions of herbivores to the Arctic could prevent 80% of permafrost thaw. <laughs> there are the scientists that you interview, who, you know, one is kind of skeptical, but there's the other one who I think is really kind of 
you know, established or has a lot of stature in the scientific Terry community. Terry Chapin. Yeah, who, who says like, what does he say? Like, what have we got to lose at this point? Like, we need to be arrogant and try different things. Oh, that's uh, Max Holmes, yeah. Right. Like, if, without arrogance, none of this would happen. Right. Um, or nothing, you, you wouldn't But also, we're kind done. of screwed now with the amount of, like, climate change that's already happened, and we're, we need to just start experimenting and trying things, right? Doesn't he say something to that effect? Yeah, Terry Chapin says we can't afford not to do these kinds of experiments at this point. Right. You know, we, we kind of have to try everything. Like, like, it's all hands on deck. Like, yeah. everything is on the table at this point. And what's the future for the park? I don't know. What's the future for Russia? Like, mm. your guess is probably better than mine about that. Like, I, I have no idea, but it's pretty attached to it. I mean, I hope that whatever happens to Russia, they can maintain the park and keep it functional. That so the scientific community will continue to go there and continue their work and continue to pay them to go to the Northeast Science Center and all that. I mean, no one can go to Russia right now, so no one's going. They're kind of cut right. off from the world. Um, you can sneak in. You can, yeah, I'm not going to try to sneak into Russia right now. You know, I'm, I learned a lot from your film. I'm happy you made it. Thank you. And I'm really excited that it's part of our show. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's entertaining. It's educational. It's super fucking weird. <laughs> and the characters are so strong. Optimistic about Pleistocene Park? Mm, yes, because when our civilization will br break, if it will break totally, all our planet will be beautiful Pleistocene Park. 